my uh, 30-year career, I was an electronics engineer with the uh, U.S. Navy Civil Service. So I retired, and uh, I like to build things. And, of course, I'd gotten used to all the high-priced test equipment we had, so I had to build some of my own and all that. But anyway, along about 2002, uh, Gerald Youngblood, uh, no, no, Gerald Youngblood, uh, had a series of four articles entitled A Software Defined Radio for the Masses. That was in QEX, uh, July 2002 through March of 2003. That's kind of a reference of, that's what kind of started the big SDR, which SDR stands for Software Defined Radio. Uh, some people have different definitions, but it was basically you have a little bit of hardware and then the software does everything else. Basically, uh, these that we have, the, so the hardware basically can uh, translates the radio frequency down to near audio, and that goes into the sound card on your computer. Uh, you do have to have a stereo sound card. And then the software does everything else. It does the demodulation of the waveform, and it can be you know, virtually any kind of modulation as long as the bandwidth is within what your sound card will be. Because like most sound cards are either uh, uh, 48 kilohertz, 96 kilohertz, or 192 kilohertz sampling rate. So that, that limits the bandwidth you can decode or the portion of the band. Most of the common software programs they have a, uh, well, they call it a waterfall display, and they have a frequency display, so you can actually see a whole chunk of the band, you know, like a pan adapter. And the width of that is determined by your sound card. They're like, you know, if you have a 192 kilohertz sampling sound card, you can see 192 kilohertz of the band. And it's centered on where your LL is, your local velocity. Okay, then, uh, a little bit after that, Gerald Youngblood formed Flex Radio. I don't know, how many of you are familiar with Flex Radio? Okay. Yeah, they make some good stuff, but it's kind of high, out of my price range. <laughs> okay. Uh, long about 2007, I think it was, after... Uh, yeah, I should have these in the other order. Um, Tony KB9YIG came out with what he called the Soft Rock, which was based on Gerald Youngblood's design. It has a quad sampling detector, which is just a uh, 25 cent uh, audio switching chip. You know, but if you apply your oscillator, it will switch at an RF rate, so that, that makes a mixer. But he, his first ones were crystal controlled, and uh, I decided, well, I wanted to kind of get in that game. I want to build some FCRs for me. And I looked at his design to see if I could improve it. And then, well, shoot, he did such a great design on it, I couldn't. <laughs> so I decided I'd go into a little bit different niche. Anyway, about that same time, which I think was 2007 to 2008, Silicon Graphics came out with an SI570 chip, which is basically a uh, direct digital synthesizer chip. But the thing was, they went, they go all the way up to 1400 megahertz if you get their, uh, you know, class A ones. And at the time, they were giving them away free to hams. So, well, their specs were 10 megahertz to 1.4 gigahertz. A couple of little gaps in there. And they were giving them away free. So he said, well, I'm going to design an SCR around that chip. And which basically is what I did with the UHF SDR. Uh, of course, as soon as I got the UHF, UHF SDR out, and around very shortly after, they stopped giving them away free. There was figures, but anyways, I mentioned I will pass. This is the actual hardware. Pass. Now the frequencies of the chip. Uh, the SAF 570 they actually made this, making three different speed grades. Of course, since you have to buy them now, the one that goes to 1.4 gigahertz is about 100 bucks in single quantity, so it's kind of pricey. Uh, they make two lower grade ones. They make one that goes to 800 megs. It's about 60 bucks, I think. They make one that goes to 260, which is under 20. 
uh, which grade you need depends on how high a frequency you want the radio to go. Okay, anyways, I mentioned get down to the UHF SDR. And I guess we can put the block diagram up on the PowerPoint, the first one, which this is a little hard to read. Uh, should be the slide before that. That one. A little hard to read, but the uh, block on the left is the, uh, well, I call it the clock generator. That's the, uh, just the SI-570. That is followed by the IQ generator. And I and Q are two signals at same frequency, 90 degrees apart. It happens if you, if you have two signals 90 degrees apart that you can generate or decode any kind of waveform, any kind of modulation. And then the third one are, are the two mixers. And at that point, it's, well, I say audio, it's actually near audio because it goes up as high as 100 kilohertz if you're sampling at 192. Because there's a Nyquist uh, theorem that says you have to sample at least twice as, at least twice as fast as your waveform is. Yeah, you know, so if, if our waveform is a, if we have 200 kilohertz of bandwidth, we have to sample well, let me rephrase that. If we have 100 kilohertz of bandwidth, we have to sample 200 kilohertz in order to re get the information. So that's, as a result, the frequency range of the UHF SDR is half of the range of the SI-570 because in the IQ generation, it gets divided by two. Some of the other inflammations guys have used, like the soft rock and most of the others, they usually divide by four. But they're also using the CMOS version, which has a single output. I use the uh, PECL version of the SI-570, which has two outputs that are already 180 degrees apart. So I only need one more division to get two outputs 90 degrees apart. Okay, I guess we can go to the next slide, which is the... Okay, this is the clock generator that... Okay, the square over there is the SI-570. It's controlled by the I, I squared C bus. The inter, I don't remember what the second I is. Computer bus, anyway. It's a control bus that has uh, two lines, a clock line and a data line. And we just have a regulator up there because that chip runs off of 3.3 volts. You can actually get them to run off of less. But. And then this guy here is an isolator for the uh, two control signals, because this board does not con have the uh, controller for the SI-570, that's external. You can either do it on your computer parallel port, which this one is set up for. I also have a USB board, so that you can do it over USB, but that's there for isolation for it, you know, to prevent noises from the ground or noises from your computer, because computers are very noisy, especially in digital buses. That goes over there, and then uh, you see a, a transformer there. That's in case I designed the board. Uh, I had some requests from people that wanted to use them up on 1296 for uh, converters, which of course this will not go. But if they put an external signal in and use that instead of the SI 570, which one of those pins you can disable, then it will go up to at least two gigahertz. I guess we can do the next slide which is the IQ generator. That's just a pair of ECL flip-flops. And they're rated to 4 gigahertz minimum on their clock rate. So, so I'd say if you put an external clock in, you can go up to, uh, you can be able to, to at least 2 gigahertz. And they cost about $4 a piece. You know, and they're in a uh, SO8 package, so that's not too bad to solder. You know, all of this is surface mount, but it's not the teeny tiny stuff. And certainly no ball grids. Okay, I guess we can do the next slide. Okay, that's the two mixers. Uh, one difference between this and the soft rocks and some of the others is they use the quad sampling detector, which is switches. Only problem with those is they're they're cheap, they're very good in amount with handling strong signals and all that. And they're very cheap. They're like less than 50 cents. The problem is you can only go to about 30 megahertz or so. 
because then your delays and stuff, you run out of steam. So, so the advantage of these, these are uh, mini circuit labs, double balanced mixers, and depending on which model you get, you know, they got them all the way up to, you know, tens of gigahertz. This particular model covers one meg to uh, a gigahertz, and it's. Uh, I think you, if I remember right, I think they're two ninety five if you buy ten. Two ninety five a piece. So the prices are reasonable. And they cover the whole wide a wide range. So. Although they have a little bit more loss of course and the, the switching detectors have very low loss. These you have you know loss from the diodes in there. But, but amplifiers are cheap. Uh, let's see, what have we got there? Okay. Up here is the audio input output. Now, being as how they're passive, it's a bi directional device. So, if you put RF into the RF input, like on a receiver, you can get audio out. Conversely, if you put audio in there and you, and you have your local oscillator going, then you'll get your modulated transmit audio going out. So, these are actually used both in transmit and receive. Let's see. Okay, this one is an attenuator. I, I put an attenuator there just because these guys, double balance mixers, like to see 50 ohms on all ports. So the attenuator kind of provides that a little bit more because the local oscillator output is actually lower than 50 ohms on ECL. And one of the kind of unique things I did on this, I'm actually directly driving this from the uh, ECL output. Because it happens that ECL is rated for 50 ohm drive. So I don't need a driver. I guess the next slide we do. Okay, this is, uh, all I call this audio. It's actually audio and near audio. Um, I have some switches here. This is for transmit receive switching. It just switches the audio around. And receive that trans transistor. Those two transistors there are real low noise audio amps because of course you're working with you know microvolt sub microvolt signals. So even though it's an audio, but it just happens that oh, those are two at 4401s, which are like under 10 cents a piece, but they're also very low noise. So. And that just goes into you know, a pair of op amps. And the output of that then goes into the sound card. And on transmit, on the right-hand side there, it comes from the sound card, just through some op amp buffers, and then that into the switching thing, that gets switched you know, to the mixers. Okay, I guess the last slide. Okay, this is the uh, RF amps, because I did put a preamp on this. For a receiver, it's just a mimic amp, which is a couple of bucks from uh, Mauser and DigiKey, which is, where is that? Yeah, on the top line there. And then the output, well, it also has a low noise trigger, about 2 dB noise trigger. So it's cheap with a decent noise trigger. I mean, you know, VHF and UHF, if you're doing moonbounce or something, so you certainly want something lower noise, but 2 dB isn't bad, especially for a couple of bucks. <laughs> Then on the output is another mimic. Uh, this particular device, this, this provides about 50 milliwatts output. The 1 dB compression on that amp is about 100 milliwatts, but the amount you get out actually depends on your, the audio amplitude coming out of your sound card. If you have about 2 volts or so, you'll get close to 100 milliwatts. Mine only has 1 volt, so I got less than 50, but... So you probably want an amplifier after that. Then we have some switches out there. Uh, there that switches the uh, I have it set up so that you can have a, a common antenna and then the, the two switch there and the switch there switch between transmit and receive or I also have ports out there those two test points there you can have separate antennas uh, let's see I think that's the last slide okay that's just a basic little bit about how that works I also have a uh, Yahoo group, which is called UHF SDR, which we're now up to, uh, see, just got a new member, so I think that makes it like 391 members now. 
you know, it's called Yahoo Groups, and and I do have to, I have a setup where I have to approve everybody. That's just so that I don't, you know, the bots don't come in. You know, just in the comments, put your call sign or whatever. You know, I do have the uh, schematics and stuff up there and links, and, and of course, we, with all those members, they can uh, get a lot of help that way. I get a lot of help that way. Okay, and uh, the rest of this, some of the other things that people will come about in the uh, software development range that come on board, they call the widget, the widget, which will also work with the USF SDR, but they support, they have their own uh, analog to digital converters on there, so you don't have to use the sound card. Um, okay, another, shoot, I forget his... It's called, but they come out when they call the cube, what that has in it, it has a digital signal processing chip in it. So you can hook up UHF SDR to it, to the digital signal processing chip, and you wouldn't, don't need to connect it to a computer then, because it will do the processing. Okay, now we get down to where, you know, the free software and all that good stuff, which the handout, I have all these URLs on. Right now, there's there's a bunch of different SDR software. But the UHF SDR will basically work with any of them that will work with a soft rock. With the exception, you have to be able to set the local oscillator to a divide by two, because they use a divide by four. It would still work, it's just your free frequency readout would be off by a factor or two. But uh, the one I use is called Power SDR IQ version 1.12.20, because it has some uh, things in it specifically for the UHF SDR, because you know, it allows you to set up the full, for the extended range of it, because soft rocks normally only go to like 30 megs, although he, Tony does have some uh, a version out for 4 meters and 6 meters and a 2 meter one, but it doesn't cover the complete range, only the those bands. Okay, uh, next one, IQ generation. IQgen.exe is not, well, that's not really an SDR software. It's a little program that generates IQ signals that I use for testing. And all of these guys are free, by the way. And Rocky is another SDR program that a lot of people like because it supposedly is simpler than Power SDR. Okay, I guess now I'll get into uh, basically kind of how I designed this thing. Uh, as I say, I'm, I'm uh, got enough money to live on, but I'm not a rich guy, so. <laughs> uh, main program I use is a program called KiCad. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. I guess not. Anyway, uh, it's a, uh, what do you call that, a group of programs. It's got a, a schematic capture program in it which I use to draw all the schematics. If you set that program up correctly, you set up your parts, uh, you define your parts in it, and I add a couple of definitions in there for the part number and the price, because that comes in handy when I generate the bill of materials. But you set that, that all up, and it, you know, it's handy to do your schematics on the computer, which is what those schematics were done on, by the way. But it's completely free. It's also open source. It also works on Windows. It works on Linux, and it works on Mac with identical uh, schematic files. Uh, and at, once you get your schematic set up, if you do it correctly, it knows what's connected to what. It outputs a board file. Then you go. It's got a, a PC board layout program as part of that. So you go into there, you import it into the PC board layout, and it's, it's got all the uh, component layouts in it. And if you define your things right in the schematic program, it already knows which footprints to use. But it's got all the footprints in there. It knows which footprints to use, and it knows what connects to what. So, you know, you imp you start that, and uh, I normally, you know, move the footprints around myself. It does have an auto router, but I don't think it works all that great. It tends to make about way too many feed throughs. So I, I do the uh, routing manually on it, but uh, at least it's better than the old days when we had to use tape and mylar. <laughs> but that's what I used to lay out, lay out the printed circuit boards, and you know, you can zoom in where 
on the PC screen where you know, some of the densest ones, the pins are 0.02 inches apart. Now, that can be like that big on your screen <laughs> if you want to go that big. But uh, but the neat thing about it, once I route it, and in fact, it's got a uh, design checker in there because, you know, since it comes from the schematic, it knows what's supposed to connect to what. It won't let me connect connected to a wrong pin, you know, unless I turn it off, which I think would be kind of dumb. Then when I get done, I have it go through the design rule checker. It checks that everything's connected right, and I've got everything connected up that needs connecting up. It also checks that the uh, lines are not too close together, which you need for manufacturing, because all the, ma the PC board manufacturing have certain specs. You know, most of um, the lines can be no closer than like six mils apart or eight mils. Some of you can go closer than that, but it costs you a lot more money. So, And they also have specifications on um, how close the pins are and all the clearances in there, but it'll check that for you. It'll flag all the ones that don't pass it. So that's really neat. And this is all a free, a free system. It, it takes a little bit of uh, a learning curve. And one of their weaknesses in there, their libraries aren't that great. However, the, it has a program you make up your own library parts, and that's once you learn to use it, which, which is fairly easy to, to use. So that way, you, know, you get a new part that's not in their library, you can add it. You know, define it, define it all yourself. And anyway, the, the print and circuit board program, that generates what's called Gerber files. Let's see, where are we at? Okay. Generates Gerber files, which is the industry standard file format that print and circuit board design houses use. So I just tell it to generate the Gerber files, uh, which is basically one file for each layer on the circuit board, and a file for the silk screen, uh, a file for the solder mask. Basically, and a, file, and a drill file for the drills. And I get mine, my boards, well, actually, production boards I do get made in an outfit in China, PC board, PCBcart.com. Because it's kind of nice. You actually order it online, they have a little form you fill out. You check you know, the size of the board, how many layers, and a few other things. And then you upload to them a zip file that contains these Gerber files that I mentioned. And you give it, you, and then uh, it sends you, it, it sends you to a PayPal, you pay them by PayPal, and it takes them about eight days to make the boards, and then they send it to me by uh, two-day FedEx. It actually gets here in two days from China. It's amazing. Well, it's really amazing. I, and, you know, I live in rural north central Idaho. You know, we're 75 miles from the nearest McDonald's. <laughs> you know, 30 miles from the nearest Radio Shack. So it's, it's kind of nice. You never have to leave my house for that. So it works well. Okay, and some of the other programs I use to uh, produce this, um, you know, a lot of people use Microsoft Office, which is nice, but man, that program's expensive if you buy it, right? <laughs> well, I use Open Office, which is basically the same thing, unless you want to get, you know, really, really fancy, but it does all the, it not only does the same thing, it will read and write Microsoft Office file formats, you know, except maybe the 2010 version or the 2008, I don't think it does, but the older versions, it will read and write those files. In fact, that first slide I show, I said with Microsoft Word, I didn't do it with Microsoft Word, I did it in Open Office. That's another free program. <laughs> you know, it's got the whole suite, like uh, Microsoft Office. Okay, the next one is called RF Sim 99. I use that for to design filters and uh, and so forth. It's an analysis program. You know, so you design low pass filters, high pass filters, and you know all that with that program. Uh, AADE filter design is also a filter design program that they give away free. And I just have to have I one of the things I found very useful I bought, which I bought a kit from AADE. Uh, they're over in Washington State, but uh, a kit for a uh, coil and capacitor meter. Yeah, you got one? Yeah, yeah, they're very handy. It's just like a multimeter, but you put a capacitor across there and 
thing. It's, you know, 263.4 picofarads or whatever. Or same thing with a coil. So it's, it's very handy. And they're right around 100 bucks, as I recall, for the kit. For the kit? Yeah, for the kit. A little more if you get it assembled. But it's an easy kit to put together. Okay, right below that is LT Spice, which is a circuit simulation program. Yeah, you can simulate your circuit, analyze it, and all that. Uh, Spice is an industry standard way of doing that. But LT Spice, linear technology, gives that away. They've kind of optimized part of it for their uh, switching regulators. You know, so if they give that away to you, so you'll design with their switching regulators. But they have a Yahoo group and a lot, of, a lot of members, and they're all using that because it's a general purpose program. So that way you can simulate your circuits before you actually build them. Yeah, and that's a free program. Below that is a mini ring core calculator program. That's if you use toroids, which we do a lot now. It has all the common toroids in there. And if you need a certain in inductance value, you can put that in there. It'll tell you how many turns once you select the core type. Or, can you, or you can go the other way. If you know the core type, and you, you can tell how many turns, it'll tell you what the inductance is. So that's extremely handy for designing filters and things. It's also free. And MP Lab, uh, uh, it's not directly related to this, but uh, Microchip, who makes the PIC processors, that's their integrated development. Uh, what's the E stand for? Environment. Integrated development environment, they have the similar and, uh, and you do all your code. You, you, you write your code for the PIC processors in there. I think it has a simulator in there, and, and you can program the PIC processor. But they give MP Lab away free, of course, so that you'll buy their processors. Uh, that would be handy if you were doing a controller for this, which I've done. A couple other boards I did, I did use PIC processors on. And a couple of them have USB interfaces. But. Okay. Next one was front panel designer. Um, that's actually Front Panel Express is actually a, a commercial outfit that makes front panels for people. You can design it in there, but you can always design it and print it out, then make your own. But or you can design it out, send them the file, and they'll make up the front panel for you. Which the program is free, the front panels aren't. <laughs> because they want you to buy their front panels. Okay, next, uh, one of the things I use a lot is a program called QPDF. There are others, but what it does, it sets up a uh, PDF printer in your computer. So like KiCad, if I say print on my KiCad schematics, and then I go up to the printer, I select QPDF as the printer. Instead of going to a printer, it makes a PDF file. That's also free. There's, there's a number of other ones that will do that same thing, but happen to like that one because it also works on Windows 7, <laughs> which is nice. Okay, then I use the print shop, which is not free, but it's like 30 bucks. But I use it for doing all my labels, and and when I make up kits, I you know I label a little package as I use that. You could do that in Open Office, but I happen to have the print shop, and it's very easy. Okay, next down where I get my good place to get parts and supplies. I like Mauser and DigiKey because for one thing they're very fast even though I'm in rural Idaho but I found a curious thing too if I ordered by UPS it'd take a week or better because let's see Mauser comes out well they have several warehouses but the one they ship to us from is down in Texas. DigiKey is in uh, Minnesota. Thief River. Thief River Falls, yeah. Minnesota. But uh, found out though, if I order by UPS, it was like ten, 9 or 10 bucks. That took over a week. But if I order uh, USPS Priority Mail, it's $5 and something. It comes in three days. <laughs> so you know what you use. <laughs> anyway, both of those have just all kinds of parts. Hey, they don't have everything, of course. Future Electronics is another uh, uh, distributor I'd go to for some things. They're, uh, a lot of times they're better on, lar on larger quantities, like if I want 100 or something. Yeah, I get good discounts, but some of their parts they'll sell in single unit quantities, but it's just another distributor. Uh, I gotta get the second paint.
Newark is probably next in line, Newark Electronics. You know, all these you can order online. And Aero Electronics, there's certain parts that are cheaper from Aero. And I found out I just designed a uh, couple of low-pass filter boards, and they have mica capacitors quite a bit cheaper than Newark or anybody else. Okay, mini circuits lab, like those mixers on there and the mimics, you know, you just about have, have to get them from uh, mini circuits, but you can order from them online. Uh, I already mentioned PCB cart, where I order the PC boards. And the last one, e supply store, that's where I get all my uh, bubble mailers and. Uh, you know, labels and things like Well, I don't get labels here, but uh, yeah, the mailing, mailing uh, supplies, though, they're really cheap on like, you know, I get my bubble mailers, or let's see, what are they? Six by 10 inch uh, with shipping, it ends up being about 15 cents a piece because you have to buy 200 of them or something, but 200 or 300. Uh, that's the end of my uh, presentation here. Let's see, I do have a A USB board I designed for another project, but a couple of people have used these in conjunction with the US UHF SDR board because they don't have parallel ports on their computers. So this guy does where it uses the uh, CY7C68013 chip, which is good for high speed USB too. So this chip is actually capable of a full 480 megabits per second. Oh, well, you don't really need that for this, but uh, it's the end of the presentation, so we'll do some questions. I can pass around the two, uh, these two guys here. There, one inside there, pop the top. The top shows the... Yeah, it's got jacks that go to the uh, sound card. It's got... Uh, yeah. Power supply jack, RF, and uh, the parallel port connector. This one I, I put the re frequency range on with the SA570. Ends up covering 1.75 to 472.5 continuous. Then it jumps to 485 to 567, 606.5 to 708.75. Okay, any questions? Yeah. What voltage is I have to provide for that port? Uh, it runs on 12 volts. Actually, the components run on less than that. But. Where are you getting those cases? Um, those are tins for uh, like candies and stuff. I have a source in LA. I did not write it down. Uh, actually, you can send me an email. I can supply that. Yeah, they they're only like a buck a piece. So they're cheap. I think I bought 25 of them or something. Yeah, they're very handy. A lot of people use Altoids, but uh, that board's a little bit too big for an Altoid. In fact, actually, I designed it for that enclosure because I had that enclosure when I did it. Got other questions here. How do you uh, what do you have to do to figure out the capability of the sound Oh, okay. How do you okay. figure out the Oh, you look at the manufacturer specs. Uh, now, as I mentioned, the, the rate, the 48, 96, or 192, that determines how much of the band you can look at at once. The other one is the number of bits. Ideally, you want 24 bits. The cheap ones on a lot, the the cheap ones on, especially older uh, motherboards, are 16 bits. That affects your dynamic range. Because theoretically, you get 6 dB per bit. Which theoretically, you get 96 dB on a 16 bit. In practice, you get more like 85, maybe. 24 bit theoretically would be 140. None of them do that. The very best ones do 120. But those are the two main specs. I could be on the air with that unit, with that board. Do you sell that board as a kit or as a completed board? Or I sell the board. I sell a mini kit. There's another guy that sells the full kit of parts. I send him the boards, so I, I still sell the boards to him. His complete kit of parts and the boards is right about 200 bucks. That's because of that SI-570. He gets them in quantity, so he gets them for about 75 
instead of 100. But that's the one big crack. Now, if you don't want to cover 70 centimeters, you get the B grade, or if you don't, or if you just want HF only, you get the C grade for a lot less, because that's the one expensive part. Do you really have to solder surface body Yes. Yeah, if you look on there, it's pretty much all surface now, but fortunately, all the latest stuff is, but. Uh, there are surface mount, of course, mixers and that. The, there are, uh, I mean, uh, non-surface mount, through hole. Uh, I was looking there. It used to be through hole ACL device, but I don't see it anymore. And, of course, that divider is, well, it has to go to 1,400 megahertz. So, and of course, the chip I got goes to 4 gigs. But it's, it's surface mount, but it's a .05 spacing, which is pretty easy. Provide 12 volts mm -hmm. sound card. Yep. The software also, this board does not have uh, band pass filtering or low pass filtering on the transmitter. I actually run mine without the band pass filter, but we're out in the middle of nowhere, so we don't, you know, my nearest broadcast transmitter is 25 miles away and they run a whole whopping 1KW. <laughs> We have other questions. Is I that good? <laughs> Anything? Okay, thank you. Thank you.